god. Are we on? Yep. Are we live? We are live. We are you live. Make sure that's that's what they're seeing. <clears throat> so you might want to scoot over to your Domo Arega. To Mr. Roboto. What's up guys? Can you hear me okay? Uh, we are streaming from janky hotel Wi-Fi in beautiful Las Vegas. Is it beautiful? Fabulous. I got uh, Marilyn Monroe eyeballing me while I sleep. Holy cow. We got Elvis Presley over here. We got Elvis. How much, how, how much should we move the camera? Uh, just careful not to unplug it. Elvis. Old man. M Marilyn. Mar this cute Marilyn. Boy. What's <laughs> up, guys? Oh, Eric, yes, it's the real Mike the Cop. Your super chat has turned me into the real <coughs> Mike the Cop. I agree with you. Uh, Vegas, Vegas isn't anything crazy. I don't really crave to come to Las Vegas, but here we are. So we're literally in our hotel room. Let's get in here, guys. We got three generations of Hold on, I'm Mike the Copy to... people. <laughs> yeah. In, in order. His sperm swam fast enough to make me and mine to make him. So we're all here because of evolution and stuff. Thanks, oh, Joe boy. Andrews. I don't like cops, but I like Mike. <laughs> well, that means you do like cops. Thanks. Because he is, there, he I mean, is one. There. It turns so. out you like some cops. That's uh, that's the way it goes. Fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, uh, guys, we've been obviously last week I started live streaming a lot, and this this week has been a little bit different because I've been really really busy. So I I tried to kind of like phone in some content that I like shared some funny videos with you early on in the week on the channel just for raw quick entertainment value. I think one video is like 27 seconds or something like that. The other one was like 47 seconds. So it wasn't it wasn't a crazy amount of content, but hopefully hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, but here we are in Vegas and that's Vegas baby. One of the reasons and it's a fast trip. We uh, worked all day Thursday, then we got on the plane, flew here, hung out for a little bit, went to bed, woke up to Mike Tyson was in my room. I had a face tattoo and tigers were here. It was crazy. And <clears throat> once we sobered up, especially my youngest yes. uh, youngest uh, member of the team, um, then we took off and went to a training that humanizing the badge, HT, uh, hold on, the HTB, uh, I'm, oh, oh, you look, you like that? Uh, Snap into a Slim Jim. HTB, Humanizing the Badge. A lot of you guys know uh, that I am part of a nonprofit called Humanizing the Badge. And we often travel to different places in the country doing community service projects and or training for uh, what we call Call for Backup. And the, there's a disturbing problem in law enforcement that cops cop families, cop supporters are afraid to talk about. The subject is sort of taboo and that is law enforcement suicide. There are some startling numbers as I've sort of like paid attention to this problem over the last few months. I'm still sort of in shock about how big, how real, how terrible of a problem this is. So we're going to give you some numbers on this. I want to talk, I want to talk about the topic a little bit. I'm going to play a video for you of someone we interviewed. And we'll kind of set that up, and then we'll not I, driving tonight. Oh, you're getting drunk at the bar, not driving. Okay, that, well, that makes it more sense now. Now that I read that correctly, so thank you very much. Uh, get drunk enough to do a five thousand dollars super chat. Get free <laughs> buffering, <laughs> hotel Wi-Fi. Oh no. Uh oh. Guy in the other room is streaming porn. Probably you're probably right. Mike's oh, face no. broke another camera. It's working for us. Well, we're we're watching the stream live as well, and it seems to be doing okay. You're good now. All right. Anyway, we're not going to restart. Were you getting a fax? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got. I had a very important fax coming in uh, from from uh, a Nigerian prince. We're going back and forth, and uh, it turns out that I, I had a relative that that passed away in Nigeria 
and all I got to do is send over some basic information and a check, and then they'll send me the they'll send me the stuff, and I, I have a million dollars. So, thank uh, you, Christian. That's pretty cool. Christian's a new sub. Christian, new sub. Thanks, thanks, buddy. So we did this training today. Uh, it's called Call for Backup. The numbers are pretty startling. There was an article what, in USA Today. Yes. I'm going to let the old man talk. <laughs> this is my dad. He's got a lot of uh, letters after his name, and he understands uh, you know, the human mind and all that stuff. Um, so what, what was the main statistic that was in there? The main focus of the article Everyone was to say questions. that more police officers and more firefighters die by suicide each year than die in the line of duty. Last year approximately 140 officers uh, took their own lives and only, well I say only, as compared to the 140 that took their own life, 129 were killed in the line of duty. About three times as many officers died by suicide last year as those who died by gunfire in the line of duty. So the uh, the impact uh, of uh, the lack of mental health uh, awareness, uh, treatment, response uh, is taking its toll uh, on our first responders. That's insane. All right, enough of that. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> somebody said in the comments, clones are real. <laughs> so this is, am I really going to look like this? Yes. In 20 years? Yes. I hope I don't look like no, I'm going to look. I'm going to look so much better than you when I'm your age. Uh, hey, Marilyn. So <laughs> the, the numbers just blow my mind when I think about that. And then I look and say, like, I, I know of, I, I, I've known officers who've taken their own lives. It's, and it's not something, like, it, it, it's this stigma. Departments don't want to be like, because, because of how lives are honored when they're lost in the line of duty, I, departments don't want to really address how it is that officers are coming to a point to where they're taking their own lives. And this is sort of like this, I, I think it's the massive amount of hypervigilance and negativity and stress that a career in law enforcement brings about. You're constantly needing to be vigilant about the situations you find yourself in. You're, you're on edge as far as stress levels go, not because you're trying to be stressed out, but because the job, by its very nature, pushes you to see the very worst of people all the time. It, it's, it's not an easy job in that sense to be a first responder. And uh, even like my dad mentioned, fire, firefighters taking their own lives and having no way to sort of like deal with the stresses of the job is a very dangerous path and it's it's so quiet. Families don't want to be embarrassed that their their family member took their own life. Departments don't want the PR of having officers who have taken their own life. It's and so you're left with someone who was suffering for some reason to the point to where that was the solution that they saw. I heard someone express it today, a permanent solution to what really is a temporary problem. It's it's a problem that can be dealt with. And we have to stop letting the stigma of suicide be something that keeps us from taking actual preventative measures to help it. And one of the, I was staggering too, what is it, 73% of officers have considered taking their own life or something um, like that? No, 43%. 43. 43% of officers say that they've that they have considered suicide for one or more of several different reasons. About the same number say that they personally have known an officer or former officer that has taken his or her own life. 78% of officers say they're personally aware of a department or agency that has lost an officer or former officer to suicide. So the numbers are staggering from that perspective, but on the other hand, uh, the numbers of actual suicides among first responders that are reported and counted seems to be very low because of what Mike was saying, that departments and families just don't want the truth to get out there. Yeah, we, we were talking about a, a department where they actually just made up a story about how he died because they didn't want to say that he killed himself. So 
This is this is a problem. Uh, Adam, 22 veteran, he super chat. Thank you. 22 veterans commit suicide a day. Yeah, I mean, it's a problem that's very related between the military and law enforcement, and that that's a great segue to this video. Mm -hmm. uh, we interviewed a guy who he'll he'll explain his nickname. I think his his nickname is Tonto. And I want you to listen to a, just a snippet of his story and get a glimpse into a little bit of the perspective of someone who who has in in his family experienced suicide and who himself has struggled with the things that he's seen and engaged in. So I want you to hear this guy's story. So check this out real quick. The underpaid producer is going to cue this video up. Well, my name's Matt. Um tanto to my friends because my last name's Taranjo and it's too hard for anyone to remember how to pronounce so everyone it, they call me tanto i've been in law enforcement 26 years uh, i'm a third generation officer my dad uh, retired after 20 something years and uh, my grandfather was a police officer down in florida which was kind of funny i'll get into that later how <laughs> the big circle of my life um, yeah. because i started my career in florida and no one ever told me that where I was in Florida was where my grandfather was a police officer until later on, so pretty neat. Before that, before law enforcement of 26 years, I did eight years of military. Uh, I was in the Army, uh, Desert Storm veteran. Um, for you military folks, it was an 11 Bravo, 2 Papa, Quebec 6, which was Airborne Infantry, NCO, and then I moved into Long Range Surveillance. So, and then before that, I was just a punk in high school. When I was eight years old, I knew I was gonna be a police officer, no doubt. I mean, they were 10 feet tall and bulletproof and they were giants and men among men. And, you know, I was a barracks rat. I used to hang out with my dad all the time down, you know, my uncle was the chief of police. So, you know, my godfather was my dad's lieutenant. And, you know, I just knew everybody that was everybody. and had all kinds of fun times, you know, that's, they took me shooting and my dad was a bomb detective so we got to blow stuff up and it was, it was a glorious time as a kid. I knew it would give me skills, which it absolutely did. I mean, now are they all the best skills? Well, it, they work. I mean, it gives you a work ethic. Um, it, it teaches you a command structure because uh, law enforcement is paramilitary, paramilitary anyway. And, you know, they have a command structure, but if you've never been in the military, you don't understand that side of it, what that structure is all about. So it, it prepared me, plus, you know, I got to be Rambo and, you know, jump out of airplanes and play with million dollar equipment and just, you know, I've been to more countries than people, most people know how to spell and it was just a phenomenal eight years. I've done all kinds of stuff, been all the way around, you know, been around the world and back again and so it was, and they paid me for it. I didn't have to pay them. So it was, it was an education beyond my wildest dreams. I did the Desert Shield, did the Desert Storm, um, and you know, experienced combat for the, you know, face to face and invaluable lessons. And it, it, it changes you too. I mean, that's, that's the beginning, you know, I, You'll never be tested greater than when you're in combat. In my military time, I was really young when that was all going on and kind of oblivious. Now, to a point. I had no real remorse. Um, combat's combat. People die. Some by your hand. But again, I was in my 20s, so. So what we did, we were heroes, right? Rock stars. But I got back and guess what? Thou shalt not kill. So and once you look the beast in the eye, he reaches in, takes a, takes a bit of your soul. That's the price you pay. It costs 
there's a cost. Now, you can hide it, you can run away from it, you can push it down, but it never leaves. Anyone thinking of a career in law enforcement, it's going to change them. I mean, all you see is the worst human, the human animal can present. So there's been some fantastic times and there's been some incredibly tragic times. You know, so it's wait till you have to go to your first um, notification of a parent. Because you don't want it to happen to you. You think you know what's going? I mean, wow. Imagine somebody knocking on your door in the middle of the night waking you up. But then you go joke and that's our defense mechanism. You know, I get with my buddies and we tell all kinds of sick jokes. And, you know, some guy can blow his head off and I can be standing over the body asking my buddy where we want to go have spaghetti for lunch, you know. It's, it's a mechanism and... So guys, that was just uh, just a snippet of Tonto's story. So the underpaid producer can produce some good videos sometimes, huh? Amen. Yeah, he's got it. Um, so I just felt like I wanted to show you guys that because it really does. Thank you, Dan, for the super chat. And they said, nice to see you, Mike Sr. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is, guys, is that I didn't know what I was getting into either in law enforcement. It does change you because you you have to have a way to process the things you see day in and day out. And fortunately for me, I feel like I have a, a lens, a grid that I see the world through, through faith that helps me with that. Uh, I've talked about that before, but it is very, very important that people who want to learn about law enforcement understand this and very, very important for law enforcement supporters to be okay with with talking about this and understanding this is a real issue. There are so many organizations committed to helping families of line of duty deaths. So very few notable resources for helping to prevent suicides or being there for the families of those who have taken their own lives. And this is becoming like a real, um, a real passionate interest of mine to make sure that I do what I can with my platform to help this issue. Because if what we do, if the we did a four hour training today for free to people in the Las Vegas area to come in and learn about the stress. We have police wives in there, a, another police chaplain or two, and we're just trying to help them come to a point to where they're okay with talking about something that is supposed to be hush hush, something that the police don't like to talk about. And we're supposed to be the tough guy, right? We're supposed to be the people who sort of like take it all in. And we are, and we do. But we have to have a way to be open and honest about that. And humor is one of those things. That is, a lot of people ask me, why do you do your videos? Why do you have your YouTube channel? What inspired you to do that? Because I want to be a part of, of guys at police departments or wherever in first responders saying, you made us laugh on a tough night. Uh, or or you, made, you made me think and see things in a little bit of a different way. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So when you guys give super chats, when you donate to, to Humanizing the Badge, or when you support me, you're helping for me to be able to do things like this. Come, come to a different city and help provide this kind of training and information to people and make an impact. So to those of you who have supported me in any way, shape, or form, you've been following me on social media, you've gotten merch, you've done super chats, you've done donations, whatever it is, thank you very much. You're helping to make a real difference. So if anybody has any like wrap-up questions, then we can wrap, wrap that up. Again, I didn't want to like keep the stream going for a long time. I wanted to just throw some numbers out there. If anyone in law enforcement or first responder is struggling with any of this stuff, you have questions, you can always go to humanizingthebadge.com and contact us. You can go to the Humanizing the Badge Facebook page and send a message. It's confidential and we can get you in touch with the right people. Or you can go to call the number four backup.info. I can put that in the description too once I post the video. Uh, and, and you can find out more about the work that we're doing. So thank you very much. I'm gonna look at the comments for a little bit. 
And the average civilian can help by spreading the word, like pushing our social media content, um, making sure that if there's opportunities for fundraisers, you donate. Like I said, any, any form of supporting me is ultimately a way to do that, but you can also give directly to the organization. We're going to be doing some fundraising this weekend on live streams on Facebook and, and other platforms. So, I mean, any, any of that will help. Yes, Noah Ackerman, we see your comment. What? They said, Mike, will you see this comment? Yeah, Noah, we saw it. I just joined. Is it over? It's wrapping up. But it'll be uploaded a bit later. Yeah, it's going to be here, so you can watch. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll take you can, a few minutes. You can go back up to four hours, and we've only been streaming for 22 minutes, so, I mean, you can find it. Yeah, a lot of people are asking what, what civilians can do. Civilians can, can support your local law enforcement and other first responders, um, finding organizations local to you, sharing Humanizing the Badge content, sharing, sharing my content. That, that's all a help and supporting us you know, financially as, as we have these needs because uh, it's not free. We, we offer the trainings for free, but it's not free for us to do it. So it does take money to make this stuff happen. Thank you, and appreciate that super chat. Texas Packet, thank you for the super chat. Yeah, we should absolutely have this stuff at the academy level. I'm hoping that more and more departments and academies can, can encourage people to do this. Another Russian rubles, uh, uh, perestroika, I don't know how to say thank you. Uh, but that's uh, Tatanka. Tchmani Tatanka Obachi. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm a very big fan of you, Amir. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, I don't want to just kind of like look like I'm rambling through the comments. I uh, just wanted to hop on here and capitalize on the fact that I I was here doing the training and the topic was fresh on my mind. So. Uh, we might stream on Facebook here shortly. We'll see. So if you follow me on Facebook, you can kind of see another version of this in a little bit. Thanks, guys.